Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. We're, we're in our series, Holding On to Truth, and I wanna give you one more week of the reliability of the Bible, and I wanna share something that we probably overlook sometimes as Christians, and it's this fact that Jesus affirms Scripture as God's word. Jesus himself affirms scripture as God's word. So what about Jesus? Does he get a chance to affirm and validate the scripture? Is Jesus a reliable source uh, of, of claiming God's word? Is, can we use Jesus to validate the truth of scripture? Uh, yes, we can. And a lot of skeptics and critics will question you on this because they go, yeah, but Jesus is in the Bible. So once again, you're using circular reasoning. And let me give you just what they say. Okay, they'll say something like this, that circular reasoning is the Bible is truth because it says it's true. Like we'll say that. We'll say the Bible is true because we say it's true. Or the Bible is truth because Jesus who's in the Bible says it's truth. So they'll say you can't use something in the Bible or a person in the Bible to say something about the Bible because that's not outside the scriptures, that's inside the scriptures. So they, they would call that circular reasoning. Uh, I, I disagree with that because Jesus is not a fictional character in this book. He lived outside this book as well. He actually existed. And you're gonna think, oh, uh, this is so silly that we have to cover this today but we're gonna cover the fact that Jesus actually existed. Does that seem silly? It did to me. And then last night, once again, my wife and I, we go on YouTube and we see tons of videos questioning whether Jesus really existed or not. And I just want you to know that we live in an age where information is flying. Just seems like at, this, at the speed of light around the world. And so people get on social media and YouTube and the internet and they share these, these beliefs that Jesus never existed. And so now Christian apologists and historians and secular historians are having to uh, dismiss that myth and that lie that Jesus never existed. And so I'm gonna take time to do that and here's why. If we're gonna trust Jesus at his word, you will run into the fact that you have to prove that he actually existed in humanity, in, 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 in the world. I, I know that seems like, wow, Ryan, we really have to do that? We do. And here's what Jesus said about the Bible in Matthew 5, 17 through 19. And he's re referring mainly to the Old Testament here. Obviously, the New Testament speaks about Jesus. So and at this time, when Jesus says this, the New Testament has not been written but the whole New Testament is about Jesus. So in this particular scripture of Matthew 5, this is about the Old Testament. And this is what Jesus says. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of God. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of God or in the kingdom of heaven. Here we have Jesus affirming the Old Testament as truth and that none of it is gonna pass away until the earth passes away, and that Jesus fulfills all the commands and all the things that had to be lived out. He fulfills them in his life, and then we're supposed to follow Jesus and believe in Jesus and fulfill anything he says to do as well. So we are supposed to follow scripture and follow Jesus, and he says not one letter, not one stroke, Will, will disappear. We don't ignore any of it. We observe it. And Jesus lived out the law. He lived out all the commands and instruction of the Old Testament. He lived it out for us and so that we follow him and follow his example to live it out as well. 
Jesus here does not deny Scripture. He accepts it. One writer says this, that Jesus has total trust for the Word of God. Total trust. He relied on it, and he submitted to Scripture. So let me answer the question, is Jesus a myth? Emphatically, no. That's the short answer. But in case you may be on the fence or anyone watching this may be on the fence, maybe your children are on the fence of whether Jesus existed or not, uh, I'm going to give you evidence for that today. This will be our last message on evidence. Uh, there's a lot of, of evidence for the reliability of the Bible, um, but this is going to be the last piece for us in this series right now. Okay, so there is a very small fraction of people who believe Jesus never even existed. Okay, I just want you to know that, and it still continues to be something that's purported online. New Testament scholar Craig Blomberg said, an inordinate number of websites and blogs make the wholly unjustified claim that Jesus never existed. Biblical scholars and historians who have investigated this issue in detail are virtually unanimous today in rejecting this view, regardless of their theological or ideological perspectives. On this same subject, whether Jesus exists or not, whether he's a myth or not, agnostic, someone who, who, who can't, he, this is what, I, so an atheist says there is no God, agnostic goes, we can't know if there is a God or not, okay, we can't know if there is a God or not, that's what agnostics claim, all right, his name is Bart Ehrman, he's actually one of the most profound New Testament scholars, but he's not even a Christian, okay, he says this, I should say at the outset that none of this literature about are written about uh, by scholars trained in New Testament or early Christian studies, teaching at the major or even the minor accredited theological seminaries, divinity schools, universities, or colleges of North America or Europe or anywhere else in the world. Of the thousands of scholars of, earth, of, of early Christianity who do teach at such schools, none of them, to my knowledge, has any doubts that Jesus existed. So that's coming from an agnostic New Testament scholar that in all the universities, there's none of them are teaching about Jesus never existing. They're all teaching that he exists. So that's just a little brief uh, tell from two scholars, one Christian, one not. But a lot of people will go, well, Jesus was never talked about in history outside the Bible. That is not true. There are a lot of different writers, uh, mainly Roman or Greek. Uh, we have Flavius uh, Josephus, we're going to take and look at him today, but I'm just going to give you two, just two um, moments, two pieces of, of history recorded because there's so many, but I'm going to give you just two today of two historians, one a Roman and one a Jew that are not Christians and are actually against Christianity, okay, and what they say about Jesus' existence. The Roman historian Cornelius Tacitus he lived between AD 56 and 120. Here's the situation with him. Okay, he uh, is considered the best source of information on this period of life. Arnaldo, I'm not going to pronounce his last name. It's very hard to pronounce. <laughs> One of the, most, uh, the foremost historiographers of the 20th century considered Tacitus a writer whose reliability cannot be seriously questioned. Like, we should not question his reliability. Historian Ronald Meller refers to him as the most accurate of all Roman historians. In short, Tacitus can be trusted. So what did Tacitus record? In AD 64, there was a devastating fire for which many people believe Nero was responsible for it. And in order to put a stop to this public outcry, Nero blamed the Christians and this is what Tacitus writes. Check this out on the screen. Therefore, to squelch the rumor, Nero created scapegoats and subjected to the most refined tortures those whom the common people called Christians, hated for their abominable crimes, in his opinion. Their name comes from Christ, who during the reign of Tiberius had been executed by the procurator Pontius Pilate. So that is very accurate. That is exactly what happened. Suppressed for the moment, the deadly superstition broke out again, not only in Judea, 
the land which originated this evil, but also in the city of Rome, where all sorts of horrendous and shameful practices from every part of the world converge and are fervently cultivated. Okay, this is Tacitus. He does not like Christians at all. And he's saying that Jesus was crucified. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, it seemed like they were suppressed, but out of nowhere, this revival broke out into Judea and to Rome. So he's affirming that the resurrection must have happened. He's implying that, but we would say that he wouldn't. The resurrection happened. He can't stand the things that Christians do. So here you have someone who's against Christianity saying that Jesus really existed. Uh, this is what two historians said. Tacitus' report provides solid, independent, non-Christian evidence for the life and death of Jesus, the remarkable resolve of his earliest followers, and the astounding growth of the movement he founded. Okay, that's one historian. Thank you for that, Pastor Ryan. But what about more evidence? Okay, let me give you Flavius Josephus, AD 37 through 100, a Jewish politician, soldier and historian, quoted as the single most important Jewish historian of the ancient world. Josephus writes about the death of Jesus' brother James, instigated by Ananus, the high priest. And this is what he says. Festus was now dead. Albinus and Albinus was, was but upon the road. So he, referring to Ananus, the high priest, assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James. So he brought James, the brother of Jesus Christ, and some others, and he delivered them to be stoned. So this happened during the time period of the apostles being alive, and Josephus was alive as well. They actually said that Josephus used to live where the apostles lived, but he moved away towards Rome, okay? And so he is recording this actual event of Jesus Christ. And this is what Professor Casey Elledge of Gustavus Adolphus College said. The testimonies of ancient historians offer strong evidence against a purely mythical reading of Jesus. It remains difficult, therefore, if not impossible, to deny the historical existence of Jesus when the earliest Christian, Jewish, and pagan evidence mentions him. Okay? So we have here already pretty compelling evidence from historians that Jesus did exist. And even now, the persecution of his people, and that would be uh, James, the brother, the half-brother of Jesus. What about New Testament writers? A lot of people say that you can't use the New Testament writers uh, like Peter and Paul and John because they're a part of the Bible. Uh, you can't use Luke. You know, they were there. They're, they're obviously too biased. You can't use them. That's so not true. We learned with all the manuscript evidence that these were historical people who lived around the time of Jesus, who lived and walked and saw Jesus for themselves, heard him teach. If anything, they should be trusted more than the other two gentlemen I just shared. Okay? Now, what did they say? And what was their writing like? You, you ready for this? The, the New Testament writers, like Peter, like James, John, Paul, they never tried to get you to believe Jesus existed. They assumed he existed because they knew he existed. The only thing they tried to do was help you believe that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, the one that came from God. That's the only thing they really try to convince people of. All right? Listen to what Luke 1, 1 through 4 says. All right? This will be on the screen for you. And this is, this is Luke talking to his friend Theophilus. Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They use the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. Okay, let me tell you real quick about Luke. He's considered a historian to other historians because he was so accurate. In fact, Luke was so accurate that he fixed other people's errors in the book of Luke. And not, not New Testament writers. We're talking about early secular writers, like writers for Rome, writers for Jews, okay? He fixed their details because they were wrong. In the book of Acts, 
He wrote the book of Acts as well, Luke. Every single place that he mentioned, we have found in archaeology. Every single place, 100%. Okay, and just so you know, when they do archaeological digs in all the sites overseas, no matter if you're a Christian site or an unchristian site, a non-Christian site, you ready for this? Guess what five books they use as historical books to help them find things in the Middle East. You ready? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Acts. Huh. Isn't that interesting? That secular historians and archaeologists use five books of the Bible to find things in Scripture are in the ground. I find that rather interesting. By the way, there's only two Christian archaeological sites in the Middle East right now. And there's about 18 secular ones. And sometimes it fluctuates depending on if they're, if they're active or not. Okay, so Luke recorded these things and they have found, historians have found him more accurate than even other historians in his time. John 20, what did John say? John 20 verse 30. The disciples saw Jesus do many miraculous or many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Amen. What about Paul? 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 9. This is one that we talk about all the time at Easter. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. For what I received, I pass on to you as first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at that same time. You keep going. And this is, this is referring to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, most of whom are still living. So at the time that Paul wrote this, they were still alive, the witnesses. This means that Paul wrote this not long after Jesus died and resurrected, though some have fallen asleep, meaning death. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. What does he mean there? Well, he doesn't take, he, he, um, he's humble about his conversion because he was the one persecuting Christians, and now he's praising Jesus and defending Christians. Verse 9, for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. I guess I could have kept on reading, huh? Wow. So just, that's just three scriptures from the New Testament where they saw Jesus. They never tried to prove his existence. They just tried to prove that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, here's what's going to happen. People are going to question you. They're, they question me. Well, the disciples just invented all of that. They invented the story of Jesus. They invented him as the Messiah. I kid you not, that is an argument, okay, in, in the world. Well, is that true? No. Let me give you a little bit of a longer answer. In Dr. John Warwick Montgomery's book, History and Christianity, he gives us three powerful reasons why the disciples were incapable of taking Jesus the man and making him into a Messiah of their liking. In other words, they didn't invent Jesus. He is who he is, okay? First of all, Jesus, as he's described in the New Testament, differs radically from the king or from the kind of Messiah that was anticipated by the Jews of his era. What, what are you talking about? Well, these Jews that wrote about him, they wanted a Messiah that would rule on earth and take over. Okay? And then they wanted a Messiah that would help, uh, that would have Greeks and Romans and others turn to Judaism to become Jews. That is not at all what Jesus did. And they definitely didn't want a king who says, my, my kingdom is not of this world. They wanted to G Jesus to be a part of this world. They wanted Jesus to reign in this world. Okay? They did not want people to um, stay in, in their life. They wanted everyone to become Jews as well. Okay? Here's what Jesus did instead. He took Jews and Greeks and made a whole new people. They did not expect that. They would never invent uh, Jesus. In fact, this is what one person says. 
No wonder the Jewish officials arranged his crucifixion. If the disciples had wanted to choose a man to make into a Messiah, Jesus would not have made the list. <laughs> he would not have made the list. <laughs> Secondly, the disciples were psychologically incapable of taking a man and calling him God. Why is that? Because a central tenet of Judaism is this scripture. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Deuteronomy 6.4. So the greatest blasphemy in Judaism was idolatry, and that is calling a person or thing God. They would never call this man God. They would never invent that because Scripture says, you shall have no other gods before me. Okay, and that's what Jesus said. He is the Messiah. He came from God. He is God in the flesh. They would have never invented that. The point is the disciples had to be convinced that Christ was the Messiah, there was no way they would have taken a mere man and made him into a God or into God. Why is that? Because they would be accused of blasphemy. They would be in trouble with the Pharisees. They would never do that. And lastly, it was the resurrection that transformed these men into convinced followers of Jesus Christ. The New Testament accounts reveal their own struggle and doubts of Jesus dying and resurrecting. But after Jesus appeared to them, their lives demonstrated a dramatic difference. So we have three reasons there. They would never make up a man, uh, the Messiah, the version of their Messiah would not look like Jesus. They would not try to claim Jesus is from God because they would be called blasphemers. And lastly, their lives changed drastically after the resurrection. And so... Let me go back to agnostic Bart Ehrman. Check out what he says here on the screen. If it is hard to imagine Jews inventing the idea of a crucified Messiah, where did the idea come from? It came from historical realities. Since no one would have made up the idea of a crucified Messiah, Jesus must really have existed, must really have raised messianic expectations, and must really have been crucified. No Jew would have invented him. Keep that on the screen for a little bit. Let me tell you about this guy. We need to pray for him. Because he knows a lot about the Bible, but he's not a Christian. And there's, there's articles swirling around, and it's hard to tell what's true or not, because you can actually find a quote where he denies Jesus exists, and he had to write an article to say that's not true. People are making up stuff about me. So atheists and agnostics, they'll take really smart scholars and say things about them that they didn't say. And so this guy has had to tell people, no, I believe Jesus existed. And apparently, he even believes Jesus is divine, but he does not want to believe in God. He does not want to follow him. We need to pray for him. We need to pray for everyone like that. There is a denial of God's divinity and him being creator and Jesus being from God, it's something the enemy's using. And what the enemy will do is he'll take really smart scholars like him and, and get people to go against us, all right? And I'm praying for this man that he would come to know Christ and believe in him as Messiah, but also believe in the sense that he will follow him and teach the truth, amen? We need to, we need to pray for him. Okay. So let me wrap this up with this. Jeez, I, are you okay? Are you good? Are we good? Okay, I know that was, that was a lot. Um, There's a different kind of uh, message series right now, giving all this evidence. But I kid you not, last night I watched a seven-minute video, and I, told my, I joked with my wife, I guess I could have just played this video because it was everything I, just, I have in my notes. And it's astounding how many people are still questioning this. Jesus lived. And then we also see historians that are not Christians say he died. And then something broke out and, and the Christians exploded. Yeah, we call that the resurrection. This stuff happens. And historians are waking up to this truth. And I'm just blown away that people still argue this. And so I want you to be equipped and know that this is true. Your kids should know this. Your teenagers, your young adults your friends and family, Jesus is real. He really lived. 
okay? I wanted to prove that, and that, I just gave you a little bit. We haven't even gotten to the places Jesus lived and all those things. But I wanted to show that to you and prove that to you because if Jesus really did live, which we believe he is, and we believe he is the Messiah, the Son of God, he is telling us to trust Scripture. Jesus is affirming the Bible. Jesus is telling us it's true. L listen, listen to these examples. Because I think, you know, if, even for me personally, I, I, I know that Jesus has great authority over, you know, all things. And whatever he says is true. But I think we forget how often Jesus talks about Scripture. It's said that he mentions or quotes the, the Old Testament a hundred times during his, during his time of living. His favorite book was the book of Deuteronomy. He constantly quoted Deuteronomy, all right? Um, he talks about a lot. Here's some examples. Jesus affirms the Genesis story. In Matthew 19, he records, you know, that man will leave uh, his mother and father and be united one with his, with his wife, okay? He affirms the Genesis story. Jesus affirmed the story of Noah and the flood. He affirmed that that actually happened. Skeptics will argue with, with you on that. Okay, if you believe Jesus exists and you believe he is the truth, whatever he says is true, amen? Look, we weren't at the flood. I can't really prove the flood happened, but I can prove Jesus lived and I can show you that Jesus says the flood happened. Like, I mean, we have, we have people who have uh, done archaeological digs. They, they believe they have found some things about the flood, okay? But what if we don't? Could you trust Jesus at his word? What if we didn't have that evidence? Yes, you can trust Jesus at his word. How about Jesus affirms a literal three days for Jonah in the belly of a fish? He really does, all right? Jesus affirms the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah as real events. Jesus affirms figures like Moses and David, which is really key because we don't have a lot of evidence for Moses, but Jesus affirms him as being a real person and doing real things. Jesus affirms the truth of Scripture when being tempted. When Jesus was being tempted by the devil, he quotes Scripture. And basically, in the Greek, when he says it, he says, God says this, though, because the devil was, was uh, distorting Scripture. See, the devil was taking Scripture and manipulating it for his means, for his gain with Jesus. And Jesus fixes it. And Jesus fixes what Satan's doing with Scripture. Have you been going under a lot of temptation? You have Scripture on your side. Have you been, been tested? You have Scripture on your side. Jesus claims the authority of Scripture against the devil. Praise God for that. He told us how to endure it. He showed us. Jesus affirms the importance of Old Testament commandments to live by in Matthew 22. Jesus affirms the authority of the Word of God, like I already said, in Matthew 5. And in Matthew 15, Jesus affirms God's word is truth. Okay, Jesus affirms all that. So let me ask you a question. Is Jesus a reliable witness and source for the historicity of the Bible? What do you think? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. John Stott, he was preaching a message and he said this. And you can put it up on the next screen. Why do we believe the Bible to be the infallible word of God? Simple. Because Jesus did and taught that we should. Simple as that. I love what Morris Inch says. Jesus directs us to Scripture even as Scripture returns us to Jesus. Wow, that's a powerful statement. That's a powerful statement. They're one. Jesus loved his father's word. Jesus would meditate on scripture. He went to the temple and read the scriptures to people. Jesus followed scripture. He submitted to it. He obeyed it. Are we followers of Christ? Yes. We should do the same as Jesus did. And this is what he says to a group of people who are challenging his divinity as the Messiah or the Son of God. John 5, 39 through 40. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me 
yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Chew on that for a moment. Because who he's talking about are Pharisees who studied the Old Testament scriptures inside and out. They memorized them. And here you have the one that they were hoping for all this time standing right in front of them and they don't believe that he is the Messiah. You can have so much knowledge but miss it here. There's an 18-inch difference from here to here almost, right? And they missed it. You know why? They were expecting a different Messiah. They had the wrong expectations. And standing in front of them was eternal life. Church, I'm, I'm bringing this up for this point as well. There is so much evidence in front of us, but people are still denying the evidence. That's because there's a spiritual battle going on for hearts. And we're not going to be able to win people with a bunch of knowledge and evidence. We can't do it just that. There has to be a work that takes place in their hearts that we got to pray that the Holy Spirit will do. But I'm bringing this to you as a church to hopefully bring even more uh, confidence that you can completely rely on Scripture as your way of life. The way you think, the way you live, the way you love people, the way you should minister, the way everything you should do. Scripture is reliable. You're safe with it. Outside of Scripture, I, I can't guarantee that. I can't guarantee that. But in Scripture, life according to Scripture, you're good. You're safe. Okay? You can formulate a worldview and you can live that out based on Scripture. All right? But people will still deny all this as truth. So we're going to pray. We're going to finish here in prayer for people. Why don't we stand together? <clears throat> I don't know, do you, have, do you have family members who have walked away from God or are currently walking away from God? Let's pray for them. You have friends, coworkers who just completely deny the Bible and God. Let's pray for them. Let's pray for Bart. Amen? Well, let's take a moment here. And just so you know, the altars are open for anyone who needs prayer for anything. Even if today, if you want to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we want to pray with you. He is eternal life. Don't miss it. I, I'm, I'm, every time I read that scripture, I go, wow, they missed everything they were looking for. He was standing right in front of them. And scripture says that the devil is blinding the eyes of unbelievers in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. The devil is blinding the eyes of unbelievers and Jesus and his creation and everything and the truth is right in front of us. We got to pray that the blinders come off. Amen. Let's do that. God, first of all, we're so grateful for your word. It is reliable. It is trustworthy. It is truth. We trust Jesus and what he says about you and your word. And God, it's not easy to live it all out. It's going to take a lifetime. But God, you've given us your Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us into all truth. God, we ask that you would help us as believers to be consistent, to walk in line with Scripture, to not water it down. We pray, God, protection over our children, our grandchildren. The world is bombarding them with lies. I pray, God, you protect them by your word, by our, our commitment to your word as parents, as grandparents. God, protect them, Lord, by your spirit from all the lies in this world. God, give us wisdom too, Lord, on, on how much our kids should be in front of screens learning these lies. Lord, protect them, God. God, we lift up those agnostics and atheists and nuns and, and skeptics, the, 
Those who say, I have no belief. I'm, I'm a nun. I don't want to believe in anything. I don't care. God, we pray for them today. That we, we pray what we sang earlier, the blood of Jesus Christ over all of them. God, we lift up by name Bart Ehrman. Lord, rescue his heart. Line up his heart with his mind. We're grateful for the knowledge, but God, may he have the faith to believe in you now. God, the same thing with our kids, Lord. Bring them back to you, God. May they trust you. This is true. It's just not always in front of them every day like everything else is. It's there. Just because they don't see the evidence doesn't mean it's not there. God, I pray that our lives as parents and grandparents, as mentors, as, as people of the church, as followers of Christ, I pray that our lives would be so consistent with the word that it would be convincing to everyone around us. God, we don't want to be hypocrites. We want to be consistent and live like Jesus. And Lord, there's a lot of different definitions of what it means to love others and what it means to accept and care for people. Lord, I pray you give us discernment on walking that balance beam out. Give our parents discernment because you have called us to love but you call us to love you first and love everyone else in the kingdom and love everyone else in the world. So help us to know how to love without confusing or affirming things that are wrong. Lord, you never affirmed sin. You never did. And we feel this pressure that we have to do that nowadays, God. We have to do that, otherwise we're not going to be liked or we're going to be ousted from our family and friends or we're going to be shunned because we don't condone their behaviors. God, I pray that you would give us the strength to stand strong and do it with grace and gentleness. Lord, I pray that the church would not let go of this truth, that we would hold on to it. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We will follow you because we trust it to be true. We trust the word to be true. We trust you to be true. We believe it to be true. I thank you, God, that you're going to save our kids. You're going to save our grandchildren. God, you're going to bring back those who are walking away from you. God, you're going to bring them back. And we pray for them, Lord. We want them to be in line with you, God. We want them to live in a relationship with you. God, I pray that we would be sensitive and discerning about those around us. Show us, Lord, how to Love them, but also to keep the truth and to stay faithful to the truth. God, we pray that you remove the blinders from the enemy in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Remove those blinders from the enemy, God. Open the eyes and the hearts to see and believe. Rescue them, God, by your grace. We pray for a Damascus Road experience for those people. You did it for Paul. You can do it for them. On on his way to persecute Christians, on their way to keep walking away from you, God, show up on their road and change their lives dramatically, God, by Jesus Christ. We plead this over them. We plead this over them. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. God, we give you all the glory and praise for what you're going to do. Be with us, God, and may we leave here with even more confidence in the reliability of Scripture. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.